Hey everybody, welcome to uh, today's edition of uh, a group of us talking about the Santa Rita Hills and about this wonderful, wonderful grape growing region that we all either call home or partial home, temporary home for me, but uh, a place that I love and love to uh, love to hang out uh, with in part because of the great, great grapes, but in part because of the wonderful folks. Uh, and in part because of incredible events, including uh, Wine and Fire, an upcoming event in August. Uh, you'll see some things flashing on the screen at different times about uh, Wine and Fire. Uh, but it is uh, it is a fantastic, fantastic tasting. Uh, there's opportunity. There you go. Look, I, it's like magic. I say it and it appears on the screen That's good. somehow. Barbara's good. Barbara's good. Yes, yeah, she has Wine and Fire events from August 12th through the 15th. So... Please check those out and uh, come down and see why we, we love the area so much. So today we are talking specifically about vineyards of the 2000s, the aught, aught, aughts, I guess, or however you want to do it. Um, I uh, am pleased to be with a great group of, of winemakers, winery owners here, and we are going to do this geographically this time. So as many of you know, there are two main routes down uh, the, the, the transverse, the, the Santa Rita Hills. Uh, one of them is Route 246, Highway 246, going from uh, Buellton to Lompoc. And then the other is Santa Rosa Road, also going from uh, just south of it, going from Buellton to Lompoc. So we're going to start on Santa Rosa Road today because I'm from Northern California and was in Santa Rosa earlier, so we might as well start in Santa Rosa Road. <laughs> And we are going to start on the westward side of the uh, the AVA, so the one closest to the ocean. And that would be, Brandon, you talking about a couple of vineyards, the Radian and Bent Rock vineyards. So tell Magical us Magical places. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the aughts uh, brought us to a pretty fun place in the story of the Santa Rita Hills. So we had folks like myself, John and Steve Dragonette, when we came into the area, we'd had the great fortune to see what the pioneers had done, you know, looking at the vines that Richard Sanford and Michael Benedict had planted, uh, John Dragonette apprenticed with Kathy Joseph at Fiddlehead. And so we'd had this uh, you know, amazing ability to kind of learn from our elders, so to speak, and work with some of the fruit from some of the more historical parts of the Santa Rita Hills. And then in the early 2000s, a little thing happened. There was a movie called Sideways. You might remember that. <laughs> and, I have heard of that, yeah. <laughs> and as a, as a young unknown winery trying to source Pinot Noir in the early 2000s, Sideways made things a little bit difficult. It was uh, pretty challenging to find fruit at that point. And fortunately, in the mid, kind of the middle of the decade, there were a handful of projects that started to develop some new vineyards throughout the AVA. And we were fortunate enough to be a part of many of those. Uh, Radian and Bent Rock, which I'll talk about in depth today, also Rita's Crown and John Sebastiano Vineyard. Mm -hmm. But there was a definite boom in planting, and it'll be fun, you know, Dan and Ofer can kind of tell their stories within the context of this as well, but that definitely was some boom years in terms of planting for the Santa Rita Hills. And so what we had seen when we'd worked with some of the vineyards in that kind of historical core, like fiddlesticks, we'd seen a little bit of diatomaceous earth in the soils. Uh, but in those vineyards, it was a minor component. It was something that you had clay soils with, you know, perhaps some chert or some other rocks, but we were on the search for this right here. And <clears throat> when we had the chance to go tour the sites that became Bent Rock and Radian, in particular Radian, we noticed at the crown of the hills, uh, there were just these absolutely striking white hills and with huge thick deposits of diatomaceous earth. And so we've been looking for that to you know, see what vines, you know, would, how the wines would express grown on those kind of soils and had the opportunity to select some of the original blocks in those vineyards. And there were both two, uh, two vineyards that at the time of planting, Radian and Bent Rock are sister vineyards that sit on a really large old California land grant called Rancho Sasapuedes. And to put it in context, you know, so Sasapuedes essentially means get out while you can. And the reason for that is they, they represent the true extreme, extreme end of the west side of the Santa Rita Hills. Whipped by fog, um, hammered by winds, uh, exposed to the sun, depending on you know, the different aspects in the vineyard. And so when that project started to get developed, it was all under one name of Rancho Sasapuedas. And then as the vineyard started to become established, they realized that they had you know, much different characteristics. And so one vineyard became Radian, another vineyard became Bent Rock, uh, but they do exist on the same property. And there is, I mean, you mentioned there being sister vineyards, differences, um, the, 
there's an elevation difference, obviously, between the two, right? I mean, bent rock yes. is uh, bent rocks are a bit lower and and radiance a bit higher. Is that correct? That is. So if we're if, we, if we're looking at this coming from, let's say you're taking a, a trip down Santa Rosa Road from Lompoc heading east into the Santa Rita Hills, uh, one of the first vineyards that you'll encounter is radiance. So there's actually a little teeny bits of radiance that are outside of the Appalachian. It truly sits at the very defining edge of the southwest corridor. And as you mentioned, it's really very high in elevation. The top blocks actually reach almost a thousand feet, which considering that the ocean is so nearby at you know, sea level, that's pretty dramatic topography. And I always liken Radian to, I mean, the analogy that I'll use for it is that it, you know, it's less like a vineyard as we think of vineyards conventionally, more like a vineyard that was planted in a ski area. I mean, it's just really incredible slopes. I mean, strikingly different elevations, uh, different aspects. That vineyard actually has you know, vines growing on north slopes, south facing slopes, east facing slopes, west facing slopes, and a, a pretty wild diversity of soil as well. So you have you know, the diatomaceous elements, which really kind of rule the top of the vineyard. But then towards the bottom, as you get down to the bottom of the vineyard, you have much more clay soil kind of typical to what you'd see in that kind of interior Santa Rita Hills, more similar to what you'd see out at Fiddlesticks or Sanford and Benedict. And then, and then Bent Rock sits, like you said, kind of further down slope. It also does have some topography, but it's nestled into the hills a little bit. So it's kind of between Rancho La Vina and Radian. Uh, and so it, it definitely is a little bit more protected where Radian is a little more exposed and extreme. So with that difference in exposure and the like, do you notice differences in shoot length and yield, cluster size, berry size, all of that kind of thing? All of the above, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and even even within the vineyards, there are certain places that are maybe a little bit more protected and a little bit more exposed that can can relate to that. But to just put it at the, at the most basic level, because radian is so hard scrabble, you know, one cluster at radian, you might need you know, three clusters at radian to make one cluster at that rock. So you okay. do have, you have particularly in the upper blocks at radian, very small vines, shoots that sort of struggle to reach you know two or three feet in height. Um, where at Bent Rock, especially in the lower blocks at Bent Rock that are a little bit more nestled away and kind of tucked in and a little more protected, you see much more vine vigor. So you have much bigger vines, uh, bigger clusters. And you know, each of those sites, you know, the, the wine styles are, are pretty radically different based on that as well. So uh, tell everybody, I mean, and I, be honest, as you always are, and all that, there are positives and there are negatives to having shorter shoots and longer shoots and more protection and less protection. <laughs> I mean, tell people what, what some of the better things about like the, the shorter areas at Radian are and, and some of the challenges that present. Yeah, and that's, at Radian, you really have three primary challenges. Um, you have, particularly in the top blocks, again, diatomaceous, you know, we, we were thinking kind of cleverly that like, this is a rock that holds moisture. It's used in for absorbent different things in terms of filter technologies. So the, the idea of planting on diatomaceous soils was to try to help us in this very dry region, you know, where something that could kind of retain water. But what we found out in the course of the last 12 years is that it's so good at holding water, sometimes it doesn't like to give it to the vine <laughs> and same with nutrients. So it's been a real challenge in terms of finding, you know, that kind of Goldilocks zone where you have enough of it to slow down vine vigor and kind of increase wine quality but you know enough other humus and organic matter in the soil that the vines can thrive. So with those, the shorter shoots and the smaller berries, you do get a high level of structure. I mean, I always think when I'm describing Pinot Noir from the Santa Rita Hills, you know, one of the things that I always talk about is structure. I think the wines have you know, tremendously fresh acidity because of the climate and the temperate you know, ocean influence, but then they also have thicker skins because all of the vineyards we're talking about today, all throughout Santa Rita, you have such a long growing season that you end up with, you know, good exposure to sunshine, even though it's that cool refrigerated sunlight. I think Richard Sanford coined that phrase. Um, and all of those things serve to thicken skins. And oftentimes, you know, winemakers will talk about this holy grail of skin to juice ratio, where you have more skins and less juice, bringing you a little more concentrated flavors, a little more powerful tannic structure. And you really see that, I mean, in it's kind of maximal form at Radiant, just because again, the really tiny berries. Um, now again, that's great for certain things in terms of wine quality. It's really can be challenging from an economic standpoint. You know, when you look at, there's blocks at Radium that unfortunately had to get pulled out, you know, within 10 years of age, just because there was this block of Chardonnay that still, to my mind, was the best Chardonnay I've ever tasted from Santa Rita Hills. Um, but it, it was about a quarter acre block that eventually got to the point where it barely would yield one barrel. 
So it just, you know, it wasn't, it was so hard scrabble. We pushed the limits too far and found the edge. <laughs> sure. I mean, at some point economically, we all got to make a living in addition to <laughs> making great wine. Um, and, yeah. and that can be limiting. So you described a little bit how the, how these differences are expressed in the wine. Could you maybe go into a little more detail and, and does it change the way you make the wine from a certain place given these different expressions? Oh, absolutely. So again, when, when you look, not only are the clusters in general smaller at Radian, but they tend because of the wind influence to have a little bit of that shatter. So when the, the, the flowers kind of get knocked off during shatter, you might have a, a, a cluster of grapes with you know, half or three quarters of the berries that you might normally see on a healthy cluster. And again, that can be a good thing for wine quality, but you have to be very careful about how you treat that winery. So at Radian, things like you know, use of whole cluster, uh, that needs to be kept down a little bit just because we sort of joke that if you did 100% whole cluster at Radian, it would be doing like three or 400% whole cluster because you have sure. so much stem to bury. Um, where at Bent Rock, it's the exact opposite. You, know, you have bigger clusters and they really have a great affinity to whole cluster. Um, and then extraction is another thing. I mean, I think that's something that's important to think about. Just, you know, the way that you're macerating, you know, the way that you're kind of gently, we, we tend to favor gentle handling of the caps to kind of extract on a more gentle style. But at Radian, if you have those little berries and thick skins, you want to be real careful because the tannins can kind of come quick. Inky color as well. I and mean, you look at that. And I think Santa Rita Hills Pinot oftentimes is rather dark in color in, compared to Pinots globally. Uh, and again, that reaches that extreme there. So you do need to be a little bit careful with that. And then on the flip side, it has so much beautiful structure and so much beautiful acidity that it pairs really well with, you know, a little bit of kind of nicely chosen new oak. Um, but, but again, the, you know, those choices will change vineyard to vineyard and Bent Rock and Radian, though they're so proximate and, you know, they're on the same bigger property, there'll be completely different winemaking choices uh, for those to represent the styles. And I don't expect you to know this exactly, but I mean, there are a number of places that the wineries, a number that you get fruit from there. I, I don't expect the exact number, but I mean, people uh, who are watching uh, could find expressions of these wines uh, from a number of different producers, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's some of the original folks in the vineyard ourselves, Ken Brown, Brian Babcock, um, were some of the kind of original placeholders, but I got to give a strong shout out to our friends at the Hilt. So these are the current owners of those two vineyards, um, taking great, great care of it. I mean, the farming has actually gone up a couple notches since they took over. Um, their wines from the, that property obviously are really, really phenomenal. Um, it's really fun to kind of see this balance of, you know, some larger producers, some smaller producers, you know, Deep Palermo, uh, Zach Wasserman's label is starting to make some fun stuff out of there. Samsara, uh, Liquid Farm. So there's, there's a lot of little folks. And then you'll also find, you know, a handful of bigger producers. I think that particularly with the last couple of years and the conditions, there's been some folks up north kind of dipping their toes in the water down there. Um, Chateau Boswell was, again, one of the kind of Northern California original folks to come down this way. I and then, know it burned down, unfortunately. So, <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, yeah, that that's the sad. story of sad, sad yeah. story of the last couple of years. Yep. Um, but it's been fun. I think that's one of the things. And I mean, this is an interesting side note, but we've had the good fortune on occasion to work with grapes from a wide number of vineyards, including Dan's Vineyard, Ofer's Vineyard, and Peter's Vineyard. So, I mean, they're. That's one of the things, the things that's really fun. And Adam, I mean, you can attest to this by how many different great vineyards that you get a chance to play with. But I think it's one of the things that's really made the region so great so quickly is just, you know, sharing of information and ideas. And we had the fortune as we were kind of getting our start to share a winery with Peter and Rebecca. And so there's that collaborative element that I think makes Santa Barbara County so special. It's either collaborative or we're vineyard sluts there, Brandon. And we just go around and, you know, if something looks attractive, we will we will jump in right away. So, But I think that, you know, there's you know, one of my favorite wine writers, Josh Reynolds. Uh, he once said that you know, having multiple people select fruit from the same vineyard is such an advantage because we're able yep. to see everyone's different style through the lens of one particular vineyard. And so you're able to define to the terroir of the vineyard so much faster than if you just had one producer implementing their own personal style. Well, and I have seen that in vineyards, certainly in the Santa Rita Hills, but in San Lucia Highlands, and then going back to um, up here in uh, Russian River areas, if multiple people are buying from a vineyard, the, it benefits the vineyard owner. Uh, it's, I mean, it's great for the consumer, great to see different uh, expressions of the place, but it's great for the, the vineyard owner to see things. Uh, I mean, I remember in 1995, I got into the Hirsch Vineyard, and the main reason David sold us fruit as he was saying he knew the vineyard was good, but selling to a really good winery 
he wasn't it's like of course they made good wine from that why don't we sell to these two young kids adam and diana who don't know what they're doing and if the wine still turns out to be good then that means the vineyard's really good and so that's kind of how that worked out in some weird that's weirdly complimentary or it worked out in some weird way for us so but i've got to say actually adam i mean your 01 hirsch vineyard pinot is one of the my epiphany wines i mean it was one of the wines that just were absolutely inspiring in terms of you know the quality that could be done you know throughout california pinot noir so Shout out to you and Hirsch for that as well. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I, I yeah. appreciate you took the chance and it worked out okay. So, <laughs> um, all right. So let's move uh, then a bit inland, a bit east on Santa Rosa Road. And we'll come to you, Peter, and Ampelos there. How far are you from uh, where uh, where Brandon was talking about with Bit Rock and Radiant? Oh, we're probably about, like I would say, like seven to eight miles, uh, mostly straight east, a little bit north of Ben Rock Radiant, something like that. That'll be my guess. But yo, Adam, first of all, thanks for having me on. And I don't know about you guys, but I got really, really dry throat here. So I think we should do a little cheers to everybody out there. This is a fun time. Sure. Thursday afternoon. Yeah, cheers, guys. I actually, I actually have some dragon at uh, Syrah right here. <laughs> That's good stuff. Hey, um, Brandon, it is always so great to listen to you because, I mean, I followed you for years. We used to make wine shoulder by shoulder many years ago. And I don't think that there's anybody I know who's been making wine from so many vineyards in Santa Rita Hills as you do. It's just, it's wonderful to listen to you and your geology knowledge and all, all of that. It's just, it's amazing. Great to see you again. Great to see everybody again. Michael, so it's great to see you. So, little Peter, bit of how, how does it change in those seven or eight miles as you're going inland? What 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 changes as far as topography, soil content, weather, that type of thing? Okay, I mean temperature for sure, because we always have, as you know, Adam, we always have, uh, often have this thing that we call the degree mile thing. So when you mm -hmm. drive out to 46, the temperature can drop one degree per mile you go as you go west. So that's one thing that changes. Now, when it comes to like the geology, and I don't want to step too much into the experts' territory, that's Brandon's territory, but what is very unique about where we are, as I'm sure you discussed before, is that we have this break at Point Conception where instead of having a north-south coastline, we have an east-west coastline, and the same thing happens with the mountains. So the mountains we got with La Parisma back there, Santa Rita Hills right that way, and down there, Santa Rosa Mountains are the east-west mountains. In between them, you have the two valleys. Dan uh, is in one of the valleys out there, you know, and uh, you know, Ofa is the beginning of that valley. The other valley that goes east-west, that is where you have the bend rock and the radiant that, uh, that Brenda was talking about earlier on. So what's interesting is when you look down on what is underneath it, what is, what's the underlying geology there? And you can compare us to Burgundy. Now, Burgundy is Jurassic time. It's like 250 million years old when it was at the bottom of the ocean. We are young here. We're only like 25, give or take, million years old. So we are much, much younger, but it's very similar in certain ways. Uh, Brandon was showing some rocks there. We've done the similar thing. We've been comparing rocks between here and Burgundy on a project we've been working with a, a, a winemaker in Burgundy, and there are a lot of similarities. Some of the soils that we have, especially on the hillsides, can be compared to some of the great soil types that they have over in Burgundy, again, with the exception of the age of the underlying rocks. Because you think about the rocks underneath it, whether it's lower or upper Monterey, which is some of the better rocks, is what really gives us that soil that we use for farming the grapes with. But and to cover a little bit of to cover a little story about what we are here. So we were in the early 90s when Rebecca and I started coming up here for the Vintners Festival. For the Back then, there was like Futures Tasting at the University Club and later on at Winecast down in, in Santa Barbara. Fell in love with the region, had a little extra money from some stock offsets in 99. We just said, wouldn't it be so darn cool? And Rebecca was shaking her head saying, we know nothing about farming. And she was right, but we did anyway. So we ended up buying these 82 acres here about five, six miles west of Buellton. And back then, that was the western end of Santa Ines Valley. That was the Appalachian back then. And we were lucky that some people had already started forming the Appalachian. They had applied with the government for the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian that came in a few years later. And that was just pure luck on our side. So at the end of 01, we moved up here. We had planted the first section of vineyard in the summer of 01, 15 acres, and just fell in love with the place. 
the more time we spend up here, the more we love it. When we got a king in the rear end at 9-11, we just moved up here permanently and learned how to farm and later on learn how to make wines. So today we got, like I have in the back here, 15 acres banned in 01, 10 more acres banned in 2004, number of different varietals that we could definitely go through. And that's what we do today. About 46,000 vines in the ground that provides us the grapes that we use for our own label employers. So you, uh, you had this money from stock options and you decided to throw it all away and get into the wine business, basically, is what it came down to. Is that, <laughs> that kind of the, yeah. the, the short story in some ways? Um, There's a blonde woman that's sitting laughing right behind me here. So I think that means yes, exactly. Yes. That's order. Well, we have to have enough money for press and for d stammer as well, an old pickup truck. But it was not like, yeah, we, we definitely put a good amount of what we had our money into making this happen. We totally believed in that this was going to be the next chapter in our life was to learn how to farm, learn how to make wine, and then figure out how the heck do you sell that stuff. So, so uh, well, one of the things that got brought up when we were talking right before this started, and I never like to get too in depth, but you brought up something that I wasn't aware of. I had mentioned that in preparing for this seminar, as opposed to preparing for the vineyard of the 90s, one of the things I noticed was that some of the vineyards planted in the, the 2000s were not just Pinot and Chardonnay. That Virtually the ones planted in the 90s pretty much were, that's all, what they were. I mean, some of them were more Chard than Pinot, some of them were more Pinot than Chard, whatever, but that's what they were. And that the vineyards that we're talking about today, in many cases, have a, a number of different things planted in them. Uh, you mentioned something about the history of the Santa Rita Hills that I wasn't aware of as far as what you were able to show as the Santa Rita winery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, we all love Richard St. Ford, our godfather out here. But Richard, as you know, is Chardonnay Pinot Noir focused. And when we started out Santa Rita Hills Wine Growers Alliance, that was literally part of the bylaws was that it was about promoting Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And, they, and you know, there were a number of other things that we could plant that we started experimenting with. But that was really the focus when we did like tasting events. It was Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And there might be a few of us that snuck in a bottle of Syrah to the table, but it was not very well appreciated back then. But, you know, the thing is that when, when what's that for there? The reason why we did what? I don't think Barbara lets us pour Syrah at the event. I'm pretty sure that's still the rule. Okay, so, I mean, that's actually a really good point. As a, one of the things that we wanted to do was in Santa Barbara County, you can plant everything. I mean, pretty much you can plant Bordeaux, Burgundy, you can plant all kind of Italian, German, whatever. One of the things we wanted to do was to create an identity. And because of the unique climate and soil we have here, we said our identity should be following the Burgundy identity and really focus on those two grapes. Now, I happen to have, as I just got corrected here, I happen to have a marriage that I want to keep going. And Rebecca is just not a Burgundy person. So when we planted the vineyard, we had to plant Syrah from the get-go because he's a Syrah person. And I'm so thrilled that we planted Syrah because it is, as you know, Ofer, it is just a great place for Rhone varietals here. I mean, Brandon, you've been working with Syrah Grenache from DSV right up the hill here. It is a wonderful place for a number of other varietals, but let us not take it away. Let's not take away the focus on Pinot and Chardonnay because we just make so amazing burgundy wines from here. Yeah, and I am just interested in, from more of a historical point of view, you know, there were times where some places you looked at, like some area center reading, you're like, oh, it's too cold. We won't be able to get anything right, or we won't be able to get this. That's That was true in the San Lucia Highlands as well, where they were like planting a lot of Riesling, and there was like, there's the old book by Richard Peterson, it was like, no, Pinot will never even ripen. And now with some different clones, different rootstock, a better farming, certainly across the board, we're getting things ripe. Um, but the idea in Santa Rita Hills, maybe in the, the 90s, where we were like planning Syrah, no, that's a suicide mission. We'll never get Syrah ripe. It turns out that it, it does work uh, in the area when farmed, obviously, correctly and, and at the right spot. And yeah, it's a super really. Yeah, Sorry. And if you add to that uh, kind of the, the climate we got here is that. It doesn't rain in September, it doesn't rain in October last year, it didn't rain in November. I mean, we got like two or three rain months if we are lucky. But what the good news about that is that we can 
really do a long hang time. We can let our Syrah hang, we typically pick that in like mid-October. We can let the Grenache hang in 2010, I picked Grenache on the 30th of November. And we can do that because the weather is so reliable, it allows us to do these long hang times. Uh, Greg Brewer a lot of times talks about, and I, and I love this analogy, and I've had the opportunity to be on the road with him, that to some extent, Santa Rita Hills is kind of like playing T-ball. You've got the ball on a tee, and if you want to pick early and hit towards the you know third base, you can do that. If you want to hit towards, the, I mean, it's it's set up where you can let things hang and hang, and very, very rarely does weather cause any of us to to pick. I mean, there is, is there a, a push to pick based on the weather? No, exactly. I mean, we never have that where we say, we've got to pick tomorrow because otherwise the whole thing is going to fall apart. Our climate is just so much more reliable here than it is. I mean, just think about the frost that they had in, in France here just a few months ago. I mean, we just don't have weather like that. I think the, the closeness, the proximity to the ocean really helps a lot in creating that great climatic stability throughout the year. Now, another thing that I think is interesting when we compare us to Burgundy is you look at the hours of sunshine. So in the summertime, because we're so far down south, our days are not that long compared to Burgundy. Their days are much longer. They've got much more sunshine photosynthesis. But as we get into the fall, our days become longer than they are over there. And that helps us again with the maturing of the grapes as we get into the later months of the year. Sure. I mean, that's compared to Burgundy. That's even compared to places that we think of like Southern France, like Chateauneuf de Pop, which is actually on the same... Uh, line as Toronto. I mean, and I was just there two weeks ago and it was like, wow, it's late. It's still light outside. You know, I mean, it's it's very different in the middle of, of summer. Um, with the, the wines from your property, Peter, uh, well, first off, another question real quick about the difference, and maybe both you and Brandon can both jump in. Water availability, is that an issue at any of these properties? And I would think sometimes at steeper places, maybe it's more challenging Peter, I mean, do you have good water at, at your property? Yes, we do have. We, we are pretty blessed because behind us, we have two valleys that goes up. There's a main one in Drum Canyon, and there's a side valley that goes up um, on the side of JSV up there. And all the rainfall that comes down there goes in the aquifer down towards St. Ines River, which is that way. So I got a, a well 165 feet down. I have a pump. I can bring my 150 gallons a minute up which is plenty for irrigating what I've got here. My quality of my water is fine. Haven't had any issue. The, the well, the pump is like 25 years old. So we're pretty blessed here. But, you know, as you get further up the hills, like some of the vineyards, like Santa Rita's ground right up here, it is more of a challenge because they have to often drill like eight, 900 feet down in order to get water up there. I mean, Brandon, you could probably, you know much more about that over at the San Sacredos. Yeah, and I think, the, I think your point is exactly right, Peter. It depends on where you're located. And I mean, Ofer is also fortunate to have enough to have some of the best water in all of Santa Barbara County as well with the Drum Canyon Aquifer. Um, but I'll oftentimes be asked, someone will come and they'll take the drive, particularly on the 246 from Buellton to Lompoc or vice versa. And people will say, look up there, there's so many of these hills that aren't planted yet. And kind of wonder if it's just not, you know, people haven't done the exploration yet. And a lot of those vineyards, the further that you get away from the river and you know, the higher in elevation you get, water can become an issue. So I think that that's, you know, it is one of the limiting factors around here. And so you do have to just kind of be careful and make sure that the property actually has either access to a good aquifer or access to the river. So when you see that sort of corridor down through Santa Rosa Road, you know, one of the things that's so great about that is that, you know, the San Inez River traveling right out there provides a good source of water. And real briefly, I mean, this is one thing, you know, a lot of times when people are talking about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is there's that reference to Burgundy or to the old world. And I think one of the things that we've learned here, you know, when you, if you talk to somebody from really almost anywhere in Europe and Bordeaux, you hear this all the time, they want really well-drained soils. But here in Santa Barbara County, we actually want some soils that hang onto the water. You know, so we're happy to have clays. You know, we, we, you know, we like these things that, you know, have a little bit more water retention. Because again, as Peter pointed out, that rain, if it's going to come at all, it's going to come in the wintertime rather than the growing season. So it is yeah, important. Yeah, as opposed to in France, where theoretically it can rain any day of the year. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, Peter, last but not least, uh, uh, before we move on over to, to 246 there, um, tell me specifically at your place how your, your unique area kind of translates into the wines. Do you do you find them um, 
like particularly structured or a little less so than say if you were up higher in the hills? How, how what what how would you define um, your wines? And I know also just as a personal matter, you really like to have some ageability on your wines that you are selling, or, or, or some age already on them. You you tend to hold on to things, keep things in barrel a while, and so and talk about that as well. Yeah, so you know, when we start out, we had absolutely no clue what we are doing, but we have some great people that helped us out with giving us good advice. It's the first one, hardly anybody remember Craig McMillan, but he was telling us, plant on the slopes, don't plant on the flatlands. So that was really what we followed from the beginning, is to really have everything on slopes. And then getting into you know the farming aspect of it, which, as you guys know, I believe like so much in in, in 05, we decided to take a move, and 06, we converted into organic biodynamic farming and later on sustainability. First, we had in the US to be certified in all three disciplines. I do believe that now, after 15 years of biodynamic farming, we are really seeing that being reflected in the soil, being reflected in the vines and their behavior throughout the year and the clusters that comes in with it. Then that whole process continues in the winery where we for over 10 years now have been natural winemaking we don't use yeast or malolactic bacteria just really let the grapes that comes in from our backyard develop themselves and just go through the winemaking process uh, and then as you mentioned we believe in long aging so i'm actually going to pour some pinot noir here from our 2017 that we just released a couple of months ago on pinot noir typically two and a half to almost three years of barrel aging uh, without any racking, just stays in the bell for that uh, time. Just uh, tomorrow we are racking our 2018 Pinots, the last 18 Pinots. So we just believe in that slow transition and let Mother Nature do the job for us. And we believe it. when you've taken good care of things in the vineyard, been a good farmer, then it will just show up in a good glass of wine. It's another way to spend all that money that you had going in, is to keep <laughs> things in barrel that long. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, That's it's a great no, but it's quite an investment to do that. It really is an investment of, of both time, but financial investment as well. And so it's really pretty neat to see that and to taste the wines. So let's jump over to 246, probably the area that most people know. I mean, the, the more transverse route uh, between Bilton and Lompoc. And we'll again start on the west side, kind of on the, the uh, Pacific side, more the, the Lompoc side. And that would be you, Dan. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, doing good. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, Tell us a little bit about exactly where where um, your vineyard is located and, and when you plant it and what led you to plant it. Okay. Um, well, we're pretty much on the western edge of the ABA uh, on this uh, this side of the road, um, and our site is uh, not up in the hills. Uh, we have rolling hills situation. Um, and uh, we get uh, we get pretty cold. Uh, we 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 get really cold. And uh, we planted the vineyard in '05, and our first harvest uh, wasn't until '09 due to uh, frost issues that I was told never happened. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not a farmer uh, by uh, <laughs> by a career. I'm an electrical engineer actually. And uh, like Peter, I uh, took my uh, stock stock money and uh, buried it in the front lawn. <laughs> um, and so I remember those frost years and those issues there, and and they, they were challenging, and particularly lower sections, that kind of thing. I mean, things really took a hit, and sometimes actually didn't recover for actually two years or two harvests after that. So. Um, Obviously, it delayed you, kind of. Um, how did you decide what to plant? How did I decide what to plant? Huh. Yeah. I mean, um, well, I thought I thought Chardonnay had a, had a real good uh, opportunity in San Rita Hills. I I actually uh, planted it on one of our uh, hillside slopes, um, and it's been it's produced some uh, really wonderful wines. Uh, Liquid Farm uh, uses our fruit too uh, over there, and Longoria has uh, for their Chardonnays. Um, and at the time, everywhere else, I planted uh, Pinot Noir. So I had uh, about two and a half acres of Chardonnay, and uh, the rest was Pinot on our 30-acre vineyard. Uh, since that time, instead of – I planted everything all at once. So since that time, instead of planting more vineyard, because I was planted out, I started grafting. Um, and we grafted over uh, a 
few acres to Syrah because I was having a hard time finding San Rita Hill Syrah that uh, uh, I could use, and I really liked um, the flavor profile of it. And uh, I really like Riesling. So uh, we planted a little Riesling. We took some cuttings from uh, Lafon Vineyard uh, and their old vines before they uh, ripped them out and uh, kind of translated them over to our, our vineyard. And uh, that wasn't too long ago. So they're coming along pretty good. And then this year, uh, we're, we're experimenting a little bit with Gamay Noir and uh, we put in uh, about two acres of that. That's fun. So what are you, are you taking out Pinot um, to do that? I mean, you talked about grafting over, is that um, kind of diversifying in that regard or? Um, yeah, I'm taking out some Pinot to do that. We planted seven different clones. Um, some clones uh, are, I sell two thirds of my fruit. So some clones are more uh, interesting to winemakers than others. And uh, the ones that, uh, uh, don't uh, have that much uh, draw. I uh, I chose to plant something else. <laughs> sure, that our Chardonnay has done really well too uh, in in this particular vineyard, and uh, I, I pulled some uh, some Pinot to graft over to Chardonnay also. And um, obviously, as you mentioned, very cold there. Um, uh, soil, uh, a bit more generous than say like the really steep slopes of bent rock, uh, that kind of, I mean, by no means is it incredibly fertile, but a, a little more generous than, than some of those sloped areas, or does it depend on where in the vineyard you are? I need you to say that a little more. <laughs> I just well, you kind of no, cut no, out on me. How, how what, the soils in your vineyard are, how consistent? Are they a bit more generous than, say, some of the steeper slopes over on Santa Rosa Road? Uh, do you get decent yields, good uh, shoot length, that kind of thing? Okay. Um, our, our soils actually are, are a bit different than what's on Santa Rosa Road. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, more of a, of a, a sand, sandy loam uh, character. Uh, there's a little bit of clay loam in our vineyard, um, but uh, most of it is uh, sandy loam and uh, it uh, is well draining soil um, and uh, we concentrate on making sure that we uh, keep it uh, well irrigated because uh, water doesn't hold in it very good. Uh, and so you do have good water availability there? Yeah the water's the water's good uh, a little bit hard but uh, um, I actually pull it out and pump it into a pond and pull from the pond so I can kind of oxidize some of the iron and things like that out of it. Uh, and that's worked really well. And uh, then you mentioned uh, you sell uh, like two thirds of the fruit and you mentioned some of the producers. Where all could people try like vineyard designated wines from you? Obviously your own winery as well. So your question is who else uses our fruit? Who else uses your fruit? Where could people who are watching this buy some buy some wines that, that show off your fruit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we've uh, sold sold fruit to a, a number of, uh, of people. We've sold fruit to Dragonette. Um, I've, I've sold to uh, Sam, Sam Sarah. We sell to Liquid Farm, Longoria, uh, Loring Wine Company, Transcendence, uh, Bona Corsi, but she's uh, retired now. Yeah. Um, Ohio Vineyard, things like that. Sure, sure, sounds great. All right, so then let's move uh, a little further uh, east on 246, and that would be you, Ofer, there at Spear. Um, thank you for being here today, really appreciate it. Thanks for putting all this together, I appreciate it. You know, the the vineyard, uh, Spear Vineyard, which is the newer, the newer planting, uh, originally, when I came to the area, and I lived on the Mesa in the 90s, so I, you know I knew of Tenenez Valley quite well. Initially, spent most of my time on the east side of the valley, which was just kind of a natural for people that maybe didn't know the valley well. There were kind of more events and happenings on the east side of the valley, like Fest Parker uh, put on a lot of events on the weekend, stuff like that. And as I got to know the valley, and as my palate kind of uh, evolved the way it ended up evolving, I found myself more and more gravitating towards the west end of the valley. So I ended up starting, you know, because you brought up the sideways analogy, and I'll tell you my takeaway from sideways. I remember the movie. Uh, I started looking for a place to to really set some roots down, literally and figuratively, uh, in 03. And I remember walking out of the movie in 04 
with my girlfriend at the time and you know saw the movie and walked out and i was pretty upset and she couldn't figure out why i was so upset and so we get in the car and she doesn't say anything doesn't say anything we get about home she's like i don't understand the movie was pretty good right you picked it and i said you know i didn't have an issue with the movie except that it probably just cost me about a billion dollars and literally and i think brandon mentioned it or peter mentioned it within a year and a half we saw uh price per acre double mm -hmm. and so it shows you that you know that form of marketing exposure especially when it's valid because you know it, it did talk about the east west transverse range it did talk about why the Santa Rita Hill, specifically the West Side Santa's Valley at the time, uh, was so special. Uh, and, you know, we had just gotten the Appalachian designation and we knew about that. And that was one of the things that really excited me when I started to look in 03. And um, by 05, I still had not been able to, I mean, I was chasing the, the, the acreage dragon at that point when I thought I had enough put aside to pick up some land. Well, prices were climbing up faster than I could accumulate um, cash. And so in 05, I ended up leasing the Nisa Vineyard. Anissa Vineyard was planted in 97. And as, as you had mentioned earlier, Adam, it was all Chardonnay, 100% mm -hmm. Chardonnay, but planted on native, you know, native rootstock, you know, planted by the Nisa family who, who's still living there and helped me farm it. And, um, you know, I got to really know the area uh, for those first five or six years and lived on the property. And um, in 07, we started selling all the fruit to Brewer Clifton. And I got to watch, you know, the decisions that, you know, for example, that Greg was making in the vineyard with Lee Nisa in order to get that fruit to where where Greg wanted it uh, for the Burr Clifton label and, and, and learned quite a bit. Uh, in 2009, the neighboring ranch came up for sale, which is currently where the Spear Vineyards and Winery is. It's just a, we, it's the neighboring 600 acres to the initial 500 acres. And look, again, prices kept going up. Uh, we were, you know, again, watching everybody chase that acreage dragon. We obviously had a bit of a correction there uh, economically in 09. Uh, and so by 10, when they put that property on the market, they were asking some pretty crazy pricing. They had a few buyers coming in and out. Everybody fell apart. 2011, I, I'm riding the fence line looking for some cattle. And I bump into uh, Richard Pierce, senior, uh, Dick. And I say, hey, what's going on? You're selling the ranch. He goes, ah, oh, you know, everybody this, everybody's flaky. The deal fell apart. We literally made a deal at the fence line and shook on it. And I bought the property. Um, and that's how it went down. It was really that simple. We did it on a handshake. We did some paperwork later on. His uh, his daughter, his, his stepdaughter technically, but his daughter handled, she was an agent. She handled the paperwork. And um, within 30 days, I, I had acquired the neighboring ranch. And um, and and the Pierce family lived on there until, until this year um with me and so basically those we, are the best deals when they can work out like that, the, best. the best way and we kind of, we basically kind of flipped the coin on the last hundred grand that we couldn't agree on sure and and uh, and i lost and so i was out another hundred grand but the deal was done and we shook on it and everybody held held their ground and and at the end of the day look i picked up roughly 600 acres for 3.3 million which when you look at it now it's the middle of santa rita hills so right. Sometimes you just got to go with your gut. And that was 2011. The market was soft. And um, and I had been very patient, you know, to my credit, because I'm generally not. I'd been sitting there for about seven years, uh, you know, nipping at the bits uh, for, for, for a new a new property to develop into what, what is what is my passion, it, which which really is red and white burgundy. So to get back to, yes, Pinot and Chard. Um, and what happened was uh, initially we had a handshake and I knew the deal was going to go through. So even before we had finished paperwork, transferring funds. We already had, you know, Pacific Ag in there, uh, you know, geofencing and figuring out what irrigation is going to come from. I already knew the hills. I knew the property. Um, you know, Jeff Newton and Ben Mers had already been through the property for years with other potential buyers. We kind of knew where we would plant. Um, the rules we went by, this is 2011. Uh, the rules that we went by was, A, I wasn't going to pull out any oak trees. Mm -hmm. Two, I wasn't going to fill in any arroyos. I wasn't going to move any topsoil. So anywhere that it, that either it had oak trees in the past or currently had oak trees, I knew the soil wasn't great. I wasn't going to literally molest the land. And so, and the, and the third rule was I wanted to have natural uh, contours in my blocks. I didn't want to start to move soil around or move roads around or trails or cut or fill in order to have uh, in order to have a, a a boundary for my for my my vineyard block um, borders and, and edges. And you'll see currently that's the way it looks. So look, we, we spent 2011, we did rip, we ripped down to about 40 inches as, as 
is prudent anytime you're putting in a new vineyard. Um, we, we didn't really have to amend much because the, the property had never been farmed. Uh, it, had been, it had been dry farmed during World War II up until about 1950 in beans. But um, from the time of the Dominguez's, which first settled the property at the turn of the century in about 1903, 1904, up through when the Pierce's acquired it in the 60s and then when I acquired it, um, it had just been a, it had been a dairy dairy cow and then later on cow calf for beef cattle operations. So it had never been farmed. And so right out of the gate, we made the decision and, and hats off to 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 you know to Peter and Rebecca. We had seen them really successful uh, through a lot of lot of effort, but we'd seen how successful the fruit could be farmed organically. And so we were organic right out of the gate. So we had our CCUF by 2012, the first year. We had vines in the ground 2012, and, and we we're off and running. What's interesting about the 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 vineyards that we have, and they're a bit of a hybrid. We yes, the lower vineyard which is about 15 acres, which is a combination of the raw, even some Gruner Veltliner and, and Chard and Pinot, that does sit on Highway 246 and, and is, and is um, just kind of north of Amplos and a little bit to the west, so northwest of Amplos. However, the upper vineyard is, is, is really a, a contrast between the two. The slope behind us is Rita's Crown and Mount Carmel. So while we are, we are, the, we are the north facing Kind of backside to Reader's Crown and Mount Carmel, and and my back fence is sea smoke. So when my cattle get out, they're generally over, over there, over at Victor's, and and that's where we generally will, will pull them out. So I mean, they get quite fat over. There. They do well. That fruit's quite good. And yeah. so we we I think of a little bit of your vineyard right here, right? Pardon me. You a can little see a little bit of your vineyard right there. Yes. Yeah. And what you really see, Peter, you see you right in front of you is is my east facing Grenache block, which is in the in, in part of that upper vineyard. You see, I've got about five acres of Grenache that we planted. Again, talking about Rhone varietals. And so we, we came in there and, you know, I was lucky as I had enough time to kind of watch uh, the winemaking that was going on. I saw the production. I saw the Rhone production coming out of a lot of the people that are on this on this call. You know, I saw the beautiful Syrah that was coming out. And I was also pressured by Jeff Newton to plant Syrah. And so I acquiesced and we planted about, um, you know, roughly 40 percent Chard, 50 percent Pinot and about 10 percent Syrah initially. And that was kind of the makeup. And, and that upper vineyard is predominantly Pinot with about an acre and a half of Syrah at the top. And then now uh, the year after in 2013, we planted about four and a half acres of Grenache facing east. And so we did, as we, we got more intelligent, myself specifically, we did move into some of the Rhone varietals because first and foremost, the wines that we were tasting from our neighbors were phenomenal. And they were really, and I keep saying they were really Rhone. They were appropriate. They actually tasted like, like, you like, exactly what you would expect from a Rhone varietal and, and, and the Grenache was a, you know, we, we were tasting some beautiful Grenache uh, output. And so we went ahead and we get really beautiful uh, extracted, you know, Noir uh, Grenache. And so we've been really pleased with that. But, you know, it's interesting. My upper vineyard is, is it kind of benefits from both soil wise. The soil is very similar that, you know, the, the soil type that you see over there kind of that comes through, absolutely comes through Rancho Salsafuetis. It comes through kind of diagonally. It doesn't run it, th this this uh, this kind of vein of calcareous soils, uh, chur and, and the diatomaceous earth deposits. For whatever reason, when that when that chunk at point conception spun, that vein is diagonal, and it's interesting because it runs uh, up through sea smoke. It runs through Rita's Crown, Mount Carmel. I know it comes through our property. I know it go ends up all the way at JSV. Where you'll find these deposits, like like Brandon held up. The Brandon's is, is probably the, the the gold winner. That's a big one. I don't know how you even slept that thing out of there. That is a serious piece of rock. But it's it's really interesting. And so, um, you know, Jeff Newton had dug dug a lot of pits for previous people on this upper vineyard. We'll call it the Spear Upper Vineyard, which is roughly halfway between 246 and and the river, and it sits exactly on the 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 Rancho Grant line that Brandon spoke about. So my fence line, my deer fence for the upper vineyard literally is on the grant line, coincidentally. And that's kind of the way they did those grant lines is they went ridge to ridge and across ridges. And that's where we're planted on. But you'll find that that soil is is very indicative of the soils you find just on the other side, whether it be uh, Rita's Crown, Mount Carmel, even even down into the top parts of Fiddlesticks, and then across, of course, into, into all of Richard's original plantings and up into Salsipuetas. And so we've been really blessed at, at Spear that we've got 
about nine major different soil types because of course we have the Narlon sand, the Arnold sand, and some of the, the sandier subtypes that you find along the 246 corridor. Um, but then we also have a lot of the, the, you know, the loamier or in the clay loam and the loamy clay and all the other uh, probably five major soil types that you find in the Sandry Hills. So when people ask us, well, what, what are your soils like? I'm like, well, you got to come see it for yourself. We kind of have the whole smorgasbord. So out of what the acreage, because you bought a lot of acreage and the yeah. amount you have planted is small in comparison. I mean, do Absolutely. you have, yeah, do you no, have we, more land that you can plant? Well, absolutely. Well, we're, listen, we're blessed. And I think um, uh, Brandon mentioned it. We're blessed with phenomenal water. So I, I have probably more wells than I'm willing to divulge. And so water is not an issue for us. What it really comes down to for us, yeah, we've, we've got about 1,100 acres. It's the middle of Santa Rita Hills. Is first and foremost, I really love the rolling hills. I love the way they look. I love the way they feel, the way they smell. And we really don't want to futz with much more of it. Uh, as long as I'm around, and I don't, I, I, I'm not, you know, trying to portray myself as a big conservationist. But on the other hand, I really don't want to um, move any more soil up there. I, I really like the way it is now. And so we really, any more plantings would be adjacent to existing plantings. Um, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, we run cattle on it predominantly because they're big lawnmowers. When you've got that much ground, you've got a thousand acres or so to mitigate fire exposure, that's really your best bet. And and so we have we have um, also found that I'm at roughly 40 acres planted between Nisa and and the spear plantings that we're talking about the upper and lower vineyard. We're at 38, 39 acres. I find it at least for myself with my kind of limited mental capacity. That's about as much as I can farm at the level that I want to farm at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I am pretty obsessive over details. Uh, I'm still learning a lot every single day, every single week, month, and vintage. And there's so much to take in and absorb down at the row level, not even at the block level, but down to the rows within a block that mm -hmm. I'm kind of at my, my, my own, at least personal capacity to be able to farm at the level that I want to farm at. I think if we start to put in, let's say another 10, 15, 20 acres, I will be diluting, uh, I will be diluting somewhere. Uh, if I, if I'm not already, you know, I, I'm already kind of at my limit, I think talent wise to farm the way we farm. And so at this point, um, you know, I'm not putting it into a conservation, into a conservation trust, but uh, we, we'd like to keep it the way it is. It's beautiful. It's rolling. And um, I think there's enough fruit out there to please everyone. We sell 75% of our yeah, fruit. I was, I was going to ask, where, where all does it go? Where I mean, with your fruit, uh, you obviously retain a, a portion of it. Yeah, we, we retain about, about 20 or 25% of it, depending on the varietal. Look, we, we sell to, uh, because we're, there aren't that many sources in the Santa Rita Hills, for, there, there are a handful of good sources for organic fruit. There aren't that many sources for certified organic fruit. So we go through the, the rigmarole, the paperwork with CCOF to have it certified. And so we sell to quite a, quite a bit. We sell about a third of our fruit goes up to Napa Sonoma and uh, from what we sell and another two thirds go, goes local. And it's, it's pretty much the, you know, I, I don't want to just start not dropping names, but you will find that most of the top producers that purchase fruit in the San Rita Hills. So these are, these are either estates to buy fruit or non-estates uh, purchase fruit from us. And, and just keep your eyes open. You'll see Spear uh, designated on quite a few bottles. And, and look, we believe in that. And it's interesting, uh, kind of like what David Hirsch uh, believed in. And I think part of the reason he was so eager to sell fruit early on, and I agree with that move, is, is look, um, I, I think that my winemaking protocols are solid, absolutely, and I'm not looking to change them. But it doesn't mean it's the only way to, to, to process my fruit. And, you know, I, I, you know, I've said this before. I'll say it again. Absolutely. Some of the best barrel tastings I've ever tasted of my own fruit were not in my cellar. They're in Brandon's cellar. And so well, that, and I think that's hurts. important. And I think that's Absolutely. one of the things that really causes a community. And we're kind of reaching the end here. But I kind of want to end on that community aspect is – the 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 way a community pulls together is to uh, share fruit, to sell fruit, to buy fruit, to taste at other people's places, to share equipment. If somebody needs, you know, oh crap, my corker broke down. You know, you you can go to a neighbor. Yeah. That 
exist, I think, in the Santa Rita Hills in ways that it doesn't exist in some other areas. And, and I really do care about the, the region in large part because of the people. I mean, the land is great and all that, but yeah. if you got people that are jerks, you know, it's it's no fun to do business with them. So. Absolutely. I, I don't know if Brandon remembers you, but he, I don't know if you remember, but you bottled my 14 for me as a favor for Mike Roth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. At the That's, end of your bowling run, we snuck in there. We drove across the road and you guys, you know, they had no heads up. We showed up with glass and wine and, and, and honestly, uh, John and Brandon couldn't have been nicer about it. I mean, they were it was, no attitude, total smile. Like, I mean, that's the way you roll. And, and look, when, when I share a block, with, and I'll use Brandon again as an example, being that you're on the call, I, we share a block of Swan Pino. And I always pretty much insist that they buy half the block because then I know when to pick. I don't have to do anything. They call me for a pick. I literally schedule Spear the same day. So for me, it's like painting by numbers at that point. And, and look, it, they, they, they have set a high bar for my own, for myself with my own fruit. And so, you know, that's fun. You know, it should be fun. This, this, this whole endeavor, you know, when it's a passion, part of it being a passion, you know, you should get enjoyment out of it. And, and so, you know, working with, with people like that and, and, and following and seeing that certain things can be done, like the way Peter and Rebecca proved that you can go completely organic and sustainable and <laughs> biodynamic. And that's that they proved it, and it can be done, and it, and it, it can be done well. And, and and obviously, you know, I've tasted through a lot of the Sidori wines. I've been lucky enough, and you know, you you've set a high bar. And Dan, and I actually Dan is one of my favorite people. I've had all of Dan's wines for a long time. In fact, my first label that Brandon was kind enough to bottle for me, you know, Dan's Dan's daughter uh, Deanna made my label for me. So that's the kind of community that we're in. Yep. Well, and the, one of the great places to have this community come together to taste all these amazing wines is certainly at the Wine and Fire weekend that we're going to have yeah. coming up. I'll, I'll end in a blatant promotion here, but why not? Um, you know, Wine and Fire, uh, we've got events going from August 12th to August 15th, um, culminating in, in the, the large grand tasting. Uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic uh a group of events and fantastic group of people. And you can hang at tables and chat with people and get to know uh, individuals and people will tell you, Hey, go try, uh, go try this wine, go try that wine. Go. It's, it's a blast. So thank you all for, for um, letting me come down to the Santa Rita Hills and be part uh, in sharing your bounty over the years. I've been there since 2000. So I, I really appreciate Y'all, uh, y'all sharing with me, and I'm glad I'm able to be here with you, and look forward to seeing y'all in in August. So, Absolutely. cheers, everybody! Thank you, Thank you Barbara. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Adam. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.